everybody. Welcome back to our overview series of the online permaculture development course with Jeff Lawton. This was week four and we studied pattern. And man, what an interesting subject to go through. We learned a lot about what certain patterns are and how we relate them to what we see in nature and just generally how to recognize some of those patterns in nature. We also learned about the pattern of learning and how we understand and receive knowledge and how information is passed down from generation to generation, not just in traditional societies, but how it's still happening today as well. So let's talk a little bit about pattern. We learned about every pattern I remember learning in school and then some, like the Fibonacci sequence or the summation series which is represented in snails, tendrils, or as Jeff Lawton put it, any spiraling growing event. Here you can see that summation series happening on the tendril of our sugar snap peas. We learned about the dendritic pattern, which you can see easily represented in plants like trees or even in river patterns. I noticed it here on our property looking at the tomatillo plant that my son is growing and how it starts at a main stalk branches off to three branches, and then each of those branches branches off to three branches, and so on. And to top it off, each branch was ending in a pattern of three leaves. One pattern I had never studied before was the torus, and I was certainly impressed with how many different places we can see it represented in nature. From our own bones and skeletal structure in our bodies, to the shape of a tree, from the roots in the ground all the way to the canopy. One thing we learned is that pattern is a representation of pressure that exists between two media. And Jeff said that there can either be a positive, a neutral, or a negative effect between these two medias. And he represented it in a chart like this, where two media interact with either a positive, negative, or neutral effect. And as we begin to compare the possible combinations we can go from a really positive event all the way to a tragedy. I think the example of a relationship that Jeff gave was a really easy way to try to remember this. He said that if we look at the chart starting at the top, having pressure where there's two positive effects would be a really hot affair. The next would be a very good relationship, then a normal relationship where everybody has a little give and take, then one where there's simply it's not going to happen, then one that ends in divorce, and one that's going to end in a murder. And I think that's a pretty uh, striking way to think about this. And then as we design, we can think about how each media is going to act on each other and what pressures are going to be created and make sure that we're trying to design for the best effects possible. We also spoke a lot in this chapter about edges. And edge effect is certainly something I can see on my own property. For example, the vast majority of our property is still wooded. So I have to take a rotary cutter through here in order to keep the path clear. If I don't, it only takes about two months before so many native species come up that I am unable to walk through an area without getting cut up with briars. However, if you look at my yard, which has a much wider edge to area ratio, I can keep this place clean much more easily. The edge effect is reduced and therefore it is easier for me to maintain. Now that can be good or bad depending on what you're looking for. I like an example Jeff gave about how gardeners spend so much time trying to weed the edges in their garden. For example, a rock path that has weeds coming up around the edges of the rock. And we talked about why that takes place and what we can do to try to prevent that. Edges clearly have a lot of importance in permaculture because they represent little niches for us that we can design in and they also bring in talking on a much larger scale of an ecosystem a much more variety and diversity of plants and animals into the area of an edge than out in a pasture or in a full forest edge being as important as it is, we talked about several examples of how to design on edges and how we get such a better yield for that. For example, a pond that has curves and bends and odd shapes, but takes up the same amount of size as a square pond, 
will be more beneficial to us because the edge ratio is more and we can get so many more benefits out of that edge. Another example was simply an open orchard where if we design in straight rows, we would get less trees per area than if we had rows that were on curves. We'd be able to get more trees in that area because we were planting on more of an edge. And just because it cracked me up so much, I have to talk about the herb spiral. The herb spiral is something you see all over the place when you start researching permaculture. It's this thing that people just lift up to high grandeur about, you know, this is permaculture. Look at this beautiful little herb spiral. And then somehow spirals become magical and it gets blown completely out of proportion. I really appreciated Jeff taking so much time to explain what the purpose of an herb spiral is and what its proper scale is. I'll give you a clue. If you can't reach the middle in one arm's length, you're doing it wrong. And the whole purpose is to provide you with different zones of climate on this spiral so that your dry loving plants can be on top and your wet loving plants be at the bottom. It needs to be small so that you can reach the middle and so you can have it right next to your house so that you can pick those culinary and aromatic herbs whenever you want them in the house. Not so big that you end up walking miles just to try to get to the middle of a circle garden. We also talked about the famous banana circles or pit gardens. And again, we're talking about it here because it's pattern. We're replicating something that we see in nature and putting it in a pattern that we would find in nature and replicating that to get a better benefit for us. Now, the only thing that's been disappointing to me is I have done so much research and I don't think I'm gonna ever get away with growing a banana here in my zone. That's just disappointing. But there are things I can do. I think we can get a papaya to grow here and we can have a papaya circle. I might even try to do it with pawpaw and a couple other varieties as well. There are even some date palms that should be able to produce copious amounts of fruit in my area, but no bananas. One of the last things we talked about is something that's going to change how we do our annual vegetable garden next year. And that is how we can do our garden on contour using footpaths as a hardware surface, a compacted surface, as little mini swales to slow the flow of water down and bring water into the double reached beds between those hardware surfaces where the soil is not compact or is software where we can grow our fruits and vegetables. Again, we keep it to scale. It's just a double reach bed, meaning you can reach to the middle on one side and go on the other and reach to the middle again. So you have a large growing surface, but still within your reach. We talked about how to design on that and the best placement for perennials and annuals, and I can't wait to get started on it next year. This year, I think it's to our benefit to leave things the way we have it because we are already producing, and next year we'll design it better. I hope you all enjoyed this week on patterns. It certainly was a lot of information. One thing I'll leave you with is that Jeff told us we do not create pattern for pattern's sake. We design with pattern in mind and use pattern in a way that actually produces us a tangible result that we can validate and explain why we did it that way. Pattern for pattern's sake is unproductive. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next time.